Uh, my name is Dr Neil Cox and I'm from the University of Reading and I'm here to talk to you um, about Wuthering Heights and storytelling and narration in Wuthering Heights and this will be the first in a couple of videos about the subject, very brief videos. Um, we know, don't we, if we've studied the book, that Wuthering Heights um, has got this kind of nested narration. There's, there's one storyteller and then they'll introduce another storyteller and the, the narration is kind of boxed. And, and we might know as well that one of the things that this is doing is it's kind of working against the idea that, that novels should have a single authoritative um, storyteller, a narrator. Um, this is a book that doesn't tell you what to think. It's got lots of different voices that sometimes contradict each other. And I don't think any of them are really completely to be trusted. And when we're thinking about this, um, one way to kind of progress our thinking uh, is to do something that seems really obvious, but actually isn't done enough, I think. And that's actually just to look at the text itself. Rather than just kind of impose a theory about storytelling in, in, the, uh, in the novel, let's have a look at what the novel says about storytellers and what the storytellers in the novel say about their own storytelling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do more of this quote um, in, in the next video, but for now, let's just, let's just have a look at this. We've got, um, we've got Nelly, yeah, um, is being impelled by Lockwood to carry on with the story of, of uh, what, what happened in the, in the Heights back in the day. Um, and Nelly says, uh, and I'll put the quote down here so you can refer back to it. Uh, when you must allow me to leap over some three years, during that space, Mrs. Earnshaw... No, no, Lockwood says. No, no, I'll allow nothing of the sort. Are you acquainted with a mood of mind in which if you were seated alone and a cat licking its kitten on the rug before you, you would watch the operation so intently that pussy's neglect of one ear would put you seriously out of temper? A terrible, lazy mood, I should say. On the contrary, a tiresomely active one. It's mine at present. And therefore continue minutely. Where to start with this? Well, let's go with the obvious thing, in, in a sense. That this idea of a cat licking its kitten. In the most obvious sense, I think, there's a kind of a metaphor at work here, isn't there? And um, what uh, Lockwood is saying is Nellie Dean's storytelling, or listening to Le Nellie Dean's storytelling, is like watching a, a cat lick its kitten. Okay, so what does that actually mean storytelling is? It seems to me that one of the takes we can get from this is that for Lockwood, storytelling, in a sense, isn't about creativity. Nellie isn't ushering forth a new story here or reframing something in a significant way. Instead, she's licking a kitten. That's what storytelling is like here. Licking. You're not changing the story because the kitten is the story. In fact, the story already exists in all of its completeness. And all one is doing in telling the story is licking the ear of the kitten. Storytelling is cleaning something that's already there. And I think one of the things we can take from this is, is that this is an especially problematic, I think, um, understanding of storytelling in terms of this being about a female storytelling. For Lockwood, Nellie isn't a brilliant, active, creative individual. She's a mama cat licking the ear of her kitten. And there's, of course, another narrator that's very significant in this, I think, and that's Isabella. Isabella is so often neglected or, or regarded as a, um, a, a silly girl or something whose, whose testimony is not important. I would argue very much against that, uh, and that notion. And I think we can see here perhaps the root of some of the neglect 
of Isabella as a storyteller because female storytellers here are not understood to be active creators. Saying that though, there's something about this image, isn't there? Because, of course, the cat is licking its kitten. So in a sense, there is creativity here, and a particular kind of female creativity is the creativity of birth. But that's kind of placed by the narration beyond itself. It's, it's something that's happened already. It's as if that creativity is being displaced into a prior place. And I'm wondering in terms of the narration, what that might have to do with this text, which is, after all, about the retrospective narration of um, this terrible, traumatic events that we never really get kind of first-hand. It's always pushed out. Look, the last thing I'm going to say about this quote, and I'm going to take, take it up again in, in the next video, is... There's something else going on here, I think. No, no, I'll allow nothing of the sort. Are you acquainted with the mood of mind in which if you were seated alone? Are you acquainted with the mood of mind? It's an odd phrase. It's not about thinking. It's not about what goes on in here, it seems to me. It's something really unpersonal about it. It's like there is a mood of mind... And that's something you can kind of wave to and become acquainted with and become mates with in some way. The mood of mind isn't yours. And in fact, Lockwood's saying, hey, Nelly, are you acquainted with this mood of mind? And then he goes on to say, oh, the mood of mind is mine at present. Well, it's mine at present. But that's a strange kind of ownership because at other times, the mood of mind, mind is perhaps not mine at all. One's mood, one's thinking, the whole sense of one's own private thoughts here are understood to be kind of mobile, but also outside of oneself. Lockwood's a dodgy man, isn't he? he we, kind of, we, really do, we really do get this sense. He's a, he's a classist, he's a sexist, he's, he's an all sort of deluded guy. Yeah. But there is this kind of strange idea here that there is something intensely non-private and non-specific about a mood. And I think rather than seeing actually that as something um, potentially generous, maybe it is, I see it also as something that's about the kind of liberality Lockwood offers. There is an appeal to him in something that's not bound by class, something that's not bound to specific people in specific situations, a kind of a general mood of mind that we can all experience at some point, perhaps. But I think actually the whole story he tells and even his telling of this story is undercutting this. I think there isn't here a universal mindset that we can share. Uh, this novel seems to be much more about the specificity of experience that cannot be easily communicated. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that next time.